the way I think about it, the reason I studied this is think about you see all the stars in the sky, you know, you see them all. Does it really make sense that we can't get there? Welcome everyone to Cosmic Consciousness. My name is Jonas and in this video once again we're going to be asking some big questions and exploring some of life's greatest mysteries. And everyone, I am extremely excited and grateful to be joined by Dr. Lance Williams, who is a physicist and one of the most brilliant individuals who I have had the pleasure of meeting over the past couple months and getting to know over the past couple months. Lance, hello, welcome, and thank you so much for, for joining today. Yeah, thank you, Jonas. It's good to be here, and I know from our discussions uh, what sort of thinker and questioner you are, and so I appreciate uh, walking the path a little way today. It's an absolute pleasure. I know you... You have so much knowledge and wisdom to share, so I, I, I'm excited to tap into that and share it with the world. So as a physicist, Dr. Williams is also the director of Confluence Research Institute, where he oversees research into exotic propulsion, what's, what's called propellantless propulsion, um, which is essentially breakthroughs in spaceflight technology. So this is really amazing and cutting edge stuff. And at the same time, he's also a published author who wrote this book here called The Spirit of Reason, which is a really fascinating discussion um, into the intersection of science and spirituality. And so, yeah, you, you have such an amazing perspective. I, I mean, so much of this channel is really f focused around this kind of intersection between um, science and spirituality, my own kind of perspective is that over time they're progressively merging and intersecting and kind of this boundary between the two are fading away a little bit. So I think I, I would love to start with your book and ask, um, well, I'm curious what what the inspiration was behind writing this book, uh, you, you know, as a physicist, um, what kind of inspired you to write this book and uh, what were some of the ideas or the messages that you wanted to share with the world? Yeah, well, well thanks for asking, Jonas. Uh, the main idea in the book and the main reason I wrote it is to show that science and religion are not two separate things. They're different aspects of one thing. Uh, and that was it in a nutshell. Um, I was originally motivated, it was about 15 years ago, by some controversies involving teaching of creationism and whether science would be allowed in textbooks or whether you know religion should be taught in textbooks. And it, that was sort of the social context that made me want to make that point. Now, of course, the whole thing is spun way out of control with you know science denial, you know, at the highest levels of power. Uh, you know, I had no idea it would you know go to this level. But I think the underlying message is still important that science and religion are aspects of the same thing, uh, you know, that same sort of divine impulse. And it is sort of written in the style of a Bible from a physicist's perspective. There's an appreciation of numbers and math, which I don't try to hide. I just try to educate people to see the beauty of that as well. So I would say that's similar. Yeah. Well, I, I think that really shines through in this book. Um, you have an a, incredible ability to present like very complex ideas in simple and easy to understand ways that are, are very accessible to a, a range of people. And in doing so, that really facilitates this discussion of this, this fundamental unity and oneness of all things. Like there is... We're, we're all expressions of this, this mystery of life, right? This, 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 this miracle mystery of existence itself. And both science and spirituality are exploring this same reality, the same underlying truth, right? Although, I mean, I, I see it as 
science is maybe a little bit more like outwardly oriented, whereas spirituality, like this spiritual inquiry is maybe a little bit more inwardly oriented. But at the end of the day, it's the same one truth that both are exploring, right? And so I don't know. Yeah, and you're right. Uh, you know, one is looking outward and one is looking inward. Um, I think as I do discuss in the book, th th there's a, a something in common there, which is the that the individual makes the decision based on you know what the individual experiences and decides. Um, you know, obviously when you're looking inward, it's very subjective, uh, and you're but you're not paying attention to dogma at that point, you're listening inward. The scientist also listens, but just outward. So it is a form of meditation. It's just like a meditation on the greater mind. This is a scientist still listening, uh, and it's still uh, not uh, something created by the scientist. It's just a listening, a greater awareness. So in that way, they are, they're also aspects of the same coin. Yes. In Christianity, you had the revolution of Luther, who said that uh, you know that they didn't need a priesthood to interpret the Bible; mm -hmm. that people could just read the Bible for themselves and trust their conscience. That's also another aspect of that same idea. Well, it's also very interesting. You um, you paint over the course of the book. You you paint these portraits of a few of the different key scientific luminaries. Um, and one thing that that's, it's, it's really interesting to note is that many of the most famous, um, scientific figures, you know, from Einstein, Maxwell, Tesla are, they, they have this, this deep kind of like religious or spiritual conviction or connection, which I don't know is, is, is interesting to me because in, t in today's world, there seems to be a very like, um, <laughs> I don't know, like mainstream science doesn't really associate itself with spirituality or with religion. And yet there, there is this phenomenon where like some of the most, you know, central figures in the history of science and the natural philosophy are these deeply religious um, um, or religiously oriented individuals. Can you comment on that? Uh, where what what might be behind that? Well, it's a good point. Yeah, for them, I think there was no difference between science and religion. Uh, and they had their faith to start with. They knew there was a God. They believed in the Bible, uh, at least to the Christian scientists at that time. So they just were uncovering God's order. And by finding Kepler's laws and the mathematical laws, it was just proof of God because obviously there was an order in there. But when it comes to Einstein, for example, I mean, he wasn't like a devoutly, uh, I, I actually don't know all that much about Einstein, but from my understanding is that like, he wasn't like a devoutly religious person. And yet he did have this deep sense of like spiritual, um, like th this, this, uh, pursuit of knowledge and uncovering kind of these, these hidden, this hidden order, these hidden mechanisms behind like this life emergence, there's something spiritual or divine in, in that process. Yes. And, uh, spiritual, divine, sublime, profound, you know, mysterious. Uh, I think he did. He's in tune with all that. And that's what we, we all have you and me and, Einstein and other seekers and uh, yeah we all share that we express it in different ways yeah and I guess part of it might be that uh, for for these people who are really you know exploring very deeply the nature of reality and existence at some point at least in my perspective at some inevitably you encounter like the incredible magnificent beauty uh, like the the orderliness, there's all these 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 patterns that are somehow like inherent or intrinsic to the natural order. Like without these underlying patterns and these hidden kind of mechanisms, none of this would be possible. Like none not like without like a perfect kind of calibration of certain things. Um, 
the universe would look way different or it wouldn't exist at all. So I don't know. I mean, that's how, in some ways that's, that's how I, that's kind of how I understand that idea is that as you become more and more familiar with these like underlying patterns, in some ways it's, it's, it's like almost like, why 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 should why should there be this underlying this sublime order the sublime simplicity and orderliness to the universe that gives rise to this infinite complexity i don't know i don't know i mean i asked that question about the mathematics i mean you can talk about there's lots of levels of beauty but just the mathematical level for me and many scientists you know, why should the universe be mathematical? Why should our brains con conceive of that? You know, um, that's really weird. I don't think we <laughs> wrote the math. I think we discovered it. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think, uh, in fact, like to take Einstein's field equations, I think it's one of the most profound accomplishments of the human mind. It's, there's so much depth and beauty and subtlety and, you know, people mine those like like a gold mine. They'll be digging in there for a thousand years, and to think that that was keyed into reality, and then the human mind could conceive of it. You know, the hard one was the first one, but once Einstein discovered it, now everyone understands it. You know, it's thousands and thousands of people see what he saw. Mm. It was real. Mm. Uh, that's the amazing thing to me. The mathematics is discoverable and knowable. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I get, I mean, I guess all that kind of, it, it raises this, this age old philosophical question in my mind, like, is there some, is there some meaning to the, and, and not, not, not that there is an answer that could be, or that there should be an answer or has to be an answer, but I asked the question nonetheless, is there some sort of deeper meaning to all this or has everything just kind of happened by chance you know <laughs> i don't know i mean you're probably better equipped to answer than me on this one but i think uh probably you and i both believe there is some deeper meaning um, but i don't know what it is i i think part of the meaning is in the process you know and um and Part of the meaning is no meaning at all because meaning is a human concept you know it's like what's the meaning of a flower you know right yeah uh, i can tell you what the meaning of the field equations are but i can't tell you the meaning of a baby or a flower or anything like that. right um, well i mean i guess so, i guess i'm 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 not being fair meaning is a is a, a word of a deeper thing that you're trying to get at that's kind of, that's kind of what i was trying to get at yeah because i i, I see that as i think a lot of scientists will openly recognize that like yes absolutely there's this beautiful orderliness to nature while at the same time being an atheist or agnostic meanwhile there there might be other uh scientists who um see that see that kind of inherent intrinsic beauty to nature as evidence for uh divinity in reality i don't know does that make any sense? Am I am I rambling on here now? <laughs> you're you're rambling a little bit. <laughs> it's okay, uh, and it and it is a hard question. Um, I, I I don't know. Um, you know, like, like there's different levels. Like I remember Carl Sagan, his story, uh, contact. Uh, I got an error on my internet. It says it might be unstable. I don't know if I'm cutting out. But anyway. Uh, you know, the theme there was like they, they found a code in Pi and like, you know, there was like a machine diagram in Pi. This wasn't in the movie. I think it was too complicated or something, you know, for the movie. But, uh, but you know, so there, there could be at that level. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. Well, I, 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 I'm also curious to hear a little bit more about your your work and your research i mean um whatever you feel comfortable sharing um this idea of propellantless propulsion is absolutely fascinating can you um just give kind of a brief lay person uh definition as to propellantless propulsion and um 
Well, I don't know where, where, where you're at with your, with your research into this, uh, because uh, I mean, for me, it clearly represents like a radical, a, a quantum leap in technology, right? Like a radical paradigm shift in our, um, yeah, that's the hope. Um, yeah, to, to explain it, I, I like to explain, you know, start with the goal or start with the problem that we're trying to solve, you know, so propulsion is an issue, uh, and you know, we want to do space travel, obviously. You know, we dream of that, you know, let's say just Mars or Jupiter's moons, you know, uh, or let alone just the nearest star. It would almost be impossible. And the reason is because our rockets use uh, uh, chemical propellant, and it takes a lot. When you have uh, rocket fuel, you have to have fuel to carry the fuel, and so... The bottom line, you know, to go to like the nearest star, you'd have to have a fuel tank the size of the moon. And so there is a problem. And, and, and it's a momentum thing because if you want to give momentum to your rocket ship so that it goes, then you have to pay that momentum tax somewhere, that momentum bill. You know, there's no free momentum in the universe. That's the problem. Mm. There's no free momentum. There's no free lunch and there's no free momentum. <laughs> and so... The only people, way people figure it out is to like carry some matter with you and then throw it out the back right. to pay that momentum tax and then get everything going. But obviously you can't carry enough potential momentum to, uh, to do that. So where do we look? And the problem it, when we look at it is actually in the nature of space and time, gravity and inertia. You know, that, so it's a gravity problem. It's an inertia problem and so a lot of this is trying to look at potential alternative propulsion mechanisms that somehow would manipulate or get around these issues with gravity and inertia it's sort of like st sidestepping the problem instead of trying to find you know free momentum somewhere like people talk about maybe the quantum vacuum or you know you could have you know a, a truckload of ferries or something to give you momentum uh, but we want to think about, sidestep that and think about, well, what is, what do we need momentum for? What are we pushing on? You know, is there something everywhere that we go that can give us momentum? So wow. it's a tough problem. And a lot of thoughts been, you know, put to it. You know, it's a complex story, but that is what it comes down to. So at the end of the day, we're willing to provide power, like electricity. We can carry a nuclear reactor. We can generate electricity, put up solar sails or, or you know, solar panels or whatever. But we want to find a way to turn electricity into momentum. So to create momentum, it has to come from somewhere. So in my work, you know, the big challenge is how do we pay that momentum tax? Hmm. The crazier people will just talk about free momentum. <laughs> And they're not going to talk about where it comes from. So I think my art and, you know, what I'm trying to do is really think very hard about inertia, gravity, momentum. Is there some way to extract momentum locally, quote, from empty space? <laughs> that's incredible. That's, 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 I mean, yeah, obviously like that demands grappling with, some of these very, very fundamental questions in physics and our understanding of uh, the cosmos, for example, gravity, right? Like, it's so simple, or so not simple, but it's so um, fundamental to our everyday lives, and taken for granted in that sense. And yet, uh, I think a lot of people don't don't realize how profound of a mystery gravity really is. Like, am, am I correct in that understanding that we're still very much struggling to grasp what gravity actually is or how it um, sort of like inst instantly uh, operates over vast distances of space and time? I, I think there are a lot of mysteries in gravity, a lot of allure. There's a lot of things to get confused on. A lot of things have been figured out, a lot of paradoxes, um, but you know, uh, gravity is, it's different than the other forces of nature in that it can always make, be made to disappear. 
So like you can see it when you, when you, or if someone jumps off a building, let's say, and then in during that moment or those seconds where they're in free fall before they hit the bottom, there's actually no gravity. They could do astronaut tricks and, you know, like spit water bubbles and juggle their Skittles and all that stuff that astronauts do with our tax dollars. You could do that in free fall, but there's gravity there. But, you know, where did the gravity go? Um, so that's one of the mysteries. Also, gravitational energy. We know gravity has energy, but you can never find it anywhere. You can never find the gravitational energy in space, but we look and we see the moon in its orbit. There's a huge amount of gravitational potential energy, you know, holding the moon in its orbit, but you can't find it anywhere. Hmm. And then in the laws of physics, there's like they said, there's no separate force of gravity. It's actually in the calculus. It's in the math. You know, I don't, some of your listeners or viewers might know calculus, but, you know, it's in the derivatives, actually. That's where gravity is. So whenever you take a derivative of anything, if it's a derivative of an electric field, and this is a mathematical operation. So you have a function, some other force in nature, you take its derivative, it involves gravity. So gravity is just in everything because it's like built into the math. Interesting. And it's what we call gravity is just space and time. So really, Newton's laws of gravity, we can show that the Newton's law of gravity follows just because clocks run slower in gravitation fields. So it, it, gravity, there's so many weird things about it. Yeah. But gravity is just tied up with space and time, uh, many mysteries. Yeah. But it takes a hell of a lot of work to lift a, a rocket ship against the Earth's gravity and out of the gravitational well and then out of the sun's gravitational well and then maybe out of the galaxy you know that gravity is real you got to do work on it hmm. but it's a really oddball thing yeah yeah and i guess it is it's also very central to the the um this great challenge of discovering kind of this unified theory right like kind of unifying um again I, I understand this on a on a pretty superficial and non-technical level, but uh, I do understand that there's this great challenge of unifying general relativity with uh, quantum theory. Is it is that correct? And and, and could you co could you comment on that? And uh, I, I know that's a I know that's a, a big uh, I don't know question or prompt, but I I am curious about. Um, uh, where we're at with that kind of um, exploration and uh, what the future might hold there. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question and it's an interesting one. And again, it just goes to what's special about gravity. Uh, because as you may know, uh, you know, there's this whole aspect of physics called quantum theory, and that's the physics that was invented to look at the very small, starting in the early 1900s. So to look at atoms and molecules. And then, you know, inside, you know, protons, electrons, and then what's inside the proton, what's inside the neutron, that sort of stuff. When you look at the very small, you get into quantum theory. Now, and, and everything is weird there. There's all, you know, we could do episodes and episodes on what's weird about quantum theory. The other piece of physics that we know and make sense is called classical physics, for want of a better term. That's what the name was given after they discovered how weird quantum theory was. They said, well, let's give this normal stuff a name we'll call classical. And that's the normal right. stuff we all know. We understand forces and baseballs and, you know, trains and battleships and frisbees, you know, and, and that all makes perfect sense. Gravity is in the classical picture. Uh, and also electromagnetism was in the classical picture, which would tell us about magnets and like if you rub cat's hair on a glass thing and your hair stands up and all that stuff. That was also a classical picture. When the quantum was discovered, they were able to transition that electromagnetic classical theory into a quantum theory, and it worked beautifully. And it became the most successful theory in physics. So they said, great, now let's do gravity. But when they tried to do gravity and make it quantum, it failed. It, it's, it's impossible. It doesn't work mathematically. No one's figured out how to do it. And people have been trying for 
you know, like a hundred years now. So the hardest, you know, the smartest people in physics have been trying for a hundred years, you know, uh, I could name them. Uh, and obviously we're not there yet. So there is no quantum gravity and that's a real mystery. Where's <laughs> quantum gravity? What's, you know, what's going on here? So, uh, and the best theories of quantum gravity that would kind of unify it and make it like the other forces we know, the quantum forces, is called string theory. Uh, string theory is just something people play with, but it doesn't make any predictions. So we're still pretty much dead in the water, but we just know a lot more math than we did 100 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's it seems like there's kind of – things have kind of plateaued in a, in a little way. Like there was this quantum revolution and that was just absolutely revolutionary. Um, and since that time it, it, it is, is my sense correct that things have kind of plateaued and like, it's, it's kind of like, where's that next uh, missing piece or something like that. I don't know. I would say, yeah, the last piece was added in the seventies. Um, so uh, we, we recognize four forces Two of them are in the atom, there's gravity, and then there's electromagnetism. And so three of the four have been unified. There is a unified field theory, more or less, for three of the four. Uh, definitely electromagnetism and the so-called weak force are unified. And the guy, you know, the theory predicted particles, which were found. They built the accelerators, found the particles. They found the Higgs boson, which you may have heard about. That was predicted. So everything is hanging together beautifully. Uh, we, you know, I would say all the particles have been discovered now. There's no more fundamental particles, period. Mm -hmm. You know, that project is over hmm. probably as of the Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. No one can think of anything else to look for anyway. And they've been looking for stuff for a hundred years. They've always known. So now it's over. Now we're just looking for new things who, you know, like throw it, you know, shot in the dark sort of stuff. W was that, uh, Sorry to interrupt you there. Oh, yeah. I, I was gonna, I was gonna ask. Like, my understanding is again, I know very little about these topics, but the the CERN um, in Switzerland, the um, uh, particle accelerator, w that was that the 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 project there w was to discover these these fundamental particles, right? Like the Higgs boson. It, is is there is now that those particles have been discovered? Is there kind of I don't know, a, a next step there? Not that's obvious to me, you know, mm -hmm. like that someone who's particle physics from reading Scientific American. I mean, they had a whole, you know, list of suspects to go out and find ending with the Higgs boson, and it's been found. So I don't know where they go from here. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I want to ask you another, uh, another question. Um, and again, this is a this is a big question. No easy answers here, but uh, I'm curious about consciousness. In in my perspective, is easily one of the greatest mysteries in existence. It's it's paradoxical because it's we're all intimately familiar with it. It's it's there's no experience of life without consciousness. We're all conscious beings. And yet it is a profound mystery. Like we are a mystery to ourselves. There's something that's absolutely incredible to me about that. But um, so clearly qu the, the quantum physics and discoveries in, in quantum have, have brought uh, consciousness into the discussion of physics in a, in a new way. Um, can you say some words about your, how you, um, your view on consciousness and how it kind of plays into, um, I don't know, our understanding of physics. I can definitely explain, you know, how consciousness enters physics, but beyond that, I'm just with the, as good as you or anyone else, but, but it is how it enters physics is not well understood. So it is worth taking a minute just to talk about what's weird about it. Um, you know, we talked about classical physics, gravity, electromagnetism, baseballs, battleships, and everything uh, is described by mathematical equations like Kepler's law. And, and so there's this clockwork universe. You know, the equations are always obeyed. You know, the equations never break down. Someone is always making the equations run. 
They're always running, you know, they're always controlling nature. Gravity's always working. Maxwell's laws are always working. The laws of thermodynamics are always working. Quantum theory, it too has an equation, just like the other equations. Mm. It's a differential equation involves calculus. It predicts interesting things we can measure. But that equation doesn't work all the time. So that's what's really weird about quantum theory. It doesn't work all the time. So, and it doesn't work when the scientist decides to investigate a system. So the equation describing the system is always working fine as long as you don't look at it. But if a scientist likes to peel the cover, then the equation stops and other stuff happens and this random process ensues. So to the extent that the scientist decides when to make the measurement and therefore when the equation will not work anymore is the extent to which consciousness enters modern physics. It's so weird. It blow it blows my mind. Like it's 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 seemingly I don't know, it's seemingly incomprehensible <laughs> to me. They call it the measurement problem. Right. So, right. So there's an equation that works. That's fine, but the measurement. When you go to do the measurement, it's all random. Like you can never if you have a lump of uh, uranium, you'll never know which atom will decay. Mm -hmm. But you do know if a million of them decay, what fraction? The ratio. You know, the ratios. But you never know which one. That's the fundamental indeterminacy. Interesting. Interesting. In, in quantum theory. Well, here, here's another. But let me say one more thing. Please. You know, in truth in advertising, because these are little systems. So if you go and look at an electron and you're real big and the electron's small, you know, you're going to interfere with it. So in a way it does sort of make sense that if you go and peel back the covers like a giant, you know, and like rip open the doll house and destroy all the dolls, you know, that something is going to be different. And mm. so in a way it does sort of make sense, but still the measurement problem is a real thing and you know, people do worry about mm. it. So, okay. Well, yeah. So I've heard um, like along these lines, a, some, I think it was some theoretical physicist or something. I don't remember exactly where I heard it, but this idea that, um, like the big bang occurred something like 13.7 billion years ago, something along those lines. Uh, theoretically quantum physics was operating at the time of the big bang. Uh, and yet there was no, uh, conscious observer or, um, uh, you know, person making any sort of measurement in that in that state and so um the he was presenting that as evidence for the uh transcendence or non-locality of consciousness that consciousness isn't just produced by the physical brain it's not contained within the the physical human body it's better understood as a kind of fundamental force or a fundamental property or quality of existence itself. I find that absolutely fascinating. Again, I don't know any of the, the, the technical details behind it. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I'm not familiar with that. I mean, what you were saying at first brought to mind something called, famous called It From Bit which a famous physicist, John Wheeler, he worried about, you know, the, like you said, the universe has been around all this time and humans just came along, you know, does something need to look at it to make it real or something? Was that uh, wh wh where you were going or? Yeah. Well, I mean, like if, if quantum, if quantum mechanics was operating billions of years ago before there was supposedly any conscious observers as we know them today, then, then where in where, where where does that leave the observer effect or the measurement problem? Because s somehow, like in order for those like fields of probability to be collapsed into like an atomic system, right? Like, do, w doesn't that have to still? Um... Yeah, I mean, yeah, people do worry about it, and and like said, the the most you know the the Wheeler it from bit is the one I think that kind of 
got it the like the loop where something has to look at itself to exist and to exist it has to look at itself <laughs> or something but I, I don't know it was you know maybe more speculation but people do worry about that or even you could just say when Galileo first saw the moons of Jupiter you know the moons of Jupiter you know were always there but we just never saw them and all of a sudden you know think you yeah. know he sees those four dots you know <laughs> You get it, you know, were they there before or, you know, did his consciousness have something to do with that? I, I don't know. I think it, it, it's fun to speculate and people do, but uh, I don't know, you know, how you, you get something useful out of it, but mm. you know, it sure is ground for speculation. Yeah, I don't know. I guess it, I, it's just a, it's a, it's a topic I'm interested in for the reason that I feel like the study of consciousness is one of the key areas where in where we're really going to see this merger of science and spirituality. Um, because my my own perspective is through um, through my through my own experiences, I've come to see consciousness or like just the pure awareness, like the the life force the the deepest essence to our being i've come to see that as transcendent as existing independently of uh the physical body the physical brain and beyond this lifetime ultimately and so that for me like in a way consciousness almost represents this this uh, idea of the soul or the spirit um i don't know I, so so that that's why I'm so fascinated and interested in explorations of consciousness and the nature of consciousness, because I believe that this is a like the scientific study of this could potentially uh, lead to breakthroughs where again the, the these like sharp distinctions between science and spirituality start to crumble and dissolve. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think so. I I think. All scientists think of something that's there like that. Uh, you know, they differ to the extent that they might bring it into their professional sphere or something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've thought a lot about it and, and you know, and we've talked about it. I, I just feel like there is some significance to the material because we are material and somehow, even if it's there's something transcendent, I still feel like there's some key in the material world like some and, and you could say maybe it's a, a drug to alter the state of consciousness that's one thing but i have in mind you know more like an ob objective key something that you know, you could do in any lab or something to get at this i know it sounds crazy to like do an experiment on religion experimental religion i i'm not sure what we're talking about but <laughs> but I, I feel like there should be some linkage in the material world that fits the spirit of our scientific progress so far. If you think about what's happened in the past 300 years, it's amazing. You know, it's obviously our scientific method and viewpoint. So, I, you know, I think we just want to keep pushing that deeper and more subtle. Uh, and, and, but I think you're exactly right. Consciousness is the key. We see it in quantum theory. You know, what we do with that useful, I don't know. That's for you and your, you know, uh, listeners and viewers to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I do think that we're reaching a very, very a fascinating time in the history of science where uh, this stuff is starting to unfold. And, and like, I don't know, I, I think that the potential for paradigm shifts for like major new revelations are well they're always there but uh i don't know somehow particularly now i which I, I was curious to ask you is there like a um a, a discovery or a scientific breakthrough or something that you that really fascinates you that you hope to see in your lifetime like a a, a new revelation in the field of science yeah it's the one i'm working on <laughs> there you go <laughs> Can you, can you elaborate on that? Well, um, like I said, if we could, you know, solve, you know, somehow find a way to mine momentum from empty space, it would be revolutionary. Is that the zero point energy, like the, the idea of zero point energy field? I'm not working on that. Other people do. Uh, I'm really looking at 
just the nature of gravity at the classical level, again, go back to our fundamental distinction. So I'm at the total classical level. Uh, and, you know, there's a couple of ways to think about manipulating gla gravity and inertia. What you're talking about, zero point, is at the quantum level. And it's the idea that, like, empty space is just this seething ocean of particles coming in and out of existence. So there's always energy there. And there is. You know, we see it in the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, and so people think, well, God, there's so much energy there. If only we could find a way to mine the quantum vacuum, you know, get that energy out. That's energy. Mm -hmm. Still no momentum, mm -hmm. you know, but at least it's energy. So, uh, and then people talk, well, if I had unlimited energy, then momentum's not a problem. But I'm not so sure about that. Hmm. I think momentum is still an issue. Um, but that's the zero point. That's the zero point is a name for the energy in the quantum vacuum, uh, the so-called quantum vacuum, which is the energy of empty space. Yes, yes. Interesting, interesting. And I don't know, I, I mean, I don't know if this is a, a question you, you can answer or are really interested in answering, but it, it, are, are, do you, in your perspective, is that within reach, like this kind of propellantless propulsion that you're, you're working on? Because that, that would obviously be a massive uh, technological revolution for humanity, right? Yeah, it would be a huge revolution. And it would be a revolution in physics. It would be, you know, it could be a revolution in energy. So, yeah, we can't underestimate it. So something so big, the odds that you're interviewing, you know, or, or anyone that could happen in our lifetime is really correspondingly small. But still, personally, the thing... I work on I'm just following the mathematics and mm -hmm. I'm not really I'm just really staying within the laws of physics and I have reason to be optimistic so um, I'm ready to find the answer either way it's a dangerous business I'm in you know you see you know some people can go right off the edge I mean that all sorts of crazy stuff um, but I for one I'm willing to you know have the answer either way but I am optimistic that that there just might be something some way um, the way I think about it, the reason I studied this is think about you see all the stars in the sky, you know, you see them all. Does it really make sense that we can't get there? You know, I mean, just getting back to the big, <laughs> you know, how things are sort of laid out for us, like the table is set, you know, oh, here's the field equations and all this. Uh, to me, that's that's where I start from. It's like I see the stars. I just can't believe we can't get there. <laughs> and I know we can't get there with the present technology. So yeah, that, that's, that's my article of faith. Yeah. Well, I mean, so it brings to mind. Um, and again, I want to, I want to just say again, that feel free to pass on any of these questions that, I, that I'm throwing at you, but this does bring to mind uh, the UFO phenomenon, which is something that I've been, absolutely fascinated in because uh there there's just an abundance of um empirical evidence radar returns eyewitness accounts videos and um many many credible witnesses um and a lot of concrete uh data now that there are these objects being tracked by the most sophisticated aerospace technology on the planet uh, the U.S. Navy in particular has had a number of encounters with um, these strange craft, the Tic Tac uh, UFO and, and stuff like this. Um, in, my, in my perspective, this is, this is absolutely a reality that seems to, to indicate that um, these exotic forms of propulsion are absolutely, absolutely possible. Um, I'm curious to hear your your thoughts on all that, and I would like to ask a uh, yeah, just start there. I would like to ask a follow up question as well. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's another good question, and um, yeah, from my my personal perspective, is, you know, I, I grew up in the '70s, and we had a lot of UFO stuff, uh, chariots, uh, chariots of the gods, I think, and I guess I never really paid much attention until. The recent New York Times article, I think it was December of 2017, um, about these, you know, the incidents with the Nimitz, 
and uh, you know these carrier groups groups off the coast. And I, you know, for me, you know, we live in an age where we don't know what media to trust. So, but to me, I trust the New York Times. I, I feel like you know they sort of delegated. You know, they do research, they check facts, they get people on the record. And, and in that series of articles, you know, they had the Senate majority leader and businessmen and, you know, people in government and the guy at the Pentagon and, and the Navy pilots. And, and I know those Navy pilots have top secret clearances, you know, and they're trained as, to know every silhouette they could possibly see in the sky. So for me as a scientist, I, you know, it would be uncomfortable for me to say, oh, that's nothing, it's crazy. You know, I assume that those are reputable witnesses and they're reporting on something, but I'm at as much of a loss as you are to think about what it could be or what it might mean. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. With my research, you know, when I heard about that, I thought, you know, maybe my research would have some implication, but I don't know. But here's the thing. When I just look at what's reported in the New York Times article and kind of do some simple math, even if what I'm working on were possible, I'm not sure it would explain that. Mm -hmm. Whatever those things are doing, I mean, you know, maybe, it, you know, it's in these theories that we look at and play around with, but, you know, it almost does seem radically different even than what I conceive of. Yeah. But, like, you know, as a scientist, I want to live in one world. So there's no data I, you know, I want to understand everything. I believe those Navy pilots. I believe that reporting um, I have my own ideas about certain things, certain aspects, but it's entirely speculative. Um, and so, you know, I think we just approach it like scientists. We, you know, need more data, more witnesses, uh, you know, to, to make progress, but it's an important question, I think. Well, I, uh, I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate your, your candor and sharing your thoughts about that. I know, I know that, you know, some people feel kind of uncomfortable discussing that issue because it is, you know, uh, it's a little, it's a little bit out there, but I, I, my, my, uh, my position or my view is that th there is some phenomenon going on here. I'm not, of course, there's, it's not necessarily beings from another planet. In some cases, I think it could be even stranger than that. But there is some phenomenon going on here. There, there's no denying that. And I also believe that by studying this phenomenon, whatever it is, we do stand to gain new insights into the secrets of the universe, into the mysteries of life. And one of the things that, that struck me as interesting was that, um, so there was this kind of this this top secret Pentagon uh, research program researching these these um, encounters, and they developed this list called the five observables, like five um, observable properties that are um, identified in in just about every one of these encounters, uh, these naval encounters with these craft. One is. Um, Anti-gravity without any uh, apparent means of lift or propulsion. Sudden and instantaneous acceleration, meaning that these craft will be tracked going, you know, something ridiculous speed like 10,000 miles an hour and do a, a right angle turn without uh, reducing their speed, with no reduction in speed. And obvi obviously that inertia, uh, if there was any you know, human piloting or, or whatever, whatever this object is, that amount of inertia would instantly, you know, k kill the occupant, um, from our kind of standard view of, of physics, um, hypersonic velocities without any signatures, like without any propulsion, uh, signatures. Uh, the fourth one is low observability or cloaking. And the fifth one is transmedium travel. And, um, What's, what does that fifth one mean? I don't know. Transmedium travel means that the, these objects are tracked moving through air and, uh, space and water, uh, with, they can, they can move through all, all these, all these mediums. Uh, I, I, I wonder if, if you, if you bear with me for a moment, I would love to share a video with you real quick. Do you see uh, a shared screen appear here? 
I do. Yeah. Okay. W- will you will you bear with me while I just play just a minute of this clip? Yeah. No, that's fine. So this is um. So what you see here is this video was recorded in 2013 in Puerto Rico, and this was right over the Aguadilla um, airport in Puerto Rico. And uh, this is an infrared video. You can see this this object here. It, there, it's it's about to pass over a street with some cars, and um, it's not moving all that fast. It's moving around like 90 miles an hour, but uh, there's no visible means of of propulsion or lift. And this is one of the videos that um, <sighs> garnered a lot of attention because this has been officially classified as an unidentified craft. And one of the really the reason I wanted to share this with you is because there's a really interesting. Um, feature here that I was hoping to get your thoughts on. See, as it as it zooms in this object, at a certain point, it submerges in the water in the ocean here without any, what's really fascinating is that it doesn't, I'm trying to uh, go frame by frame here, but I'm not doing the, gr- the best job. It doesn't seem to displace any water. There's no splash as it, it's it's moving around at a hundred miles an hour, and like as this object like going frame by frame enters the water, there's there's no splash and there's no reduction in its speed. And so and so this this is like uh this is the the idea of transmedium travel. And again, uh, I'm just I'm just like throwing all this out there because. My sense is that by studying these like observable characteristics of these objects, whatever they may be, we can get new insights into like the laws of of nature and the cosmos and the universe. Do you have any 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 like thoughts or comments on that that like specific uh it's such a it's such a curious feature of of this this object that it enters the water without any like water displacement or any any splash? I don't know. Yeah, and first, I, I just say, you know, as a scientist, there's no questions we can't ask. You know, we can talk about these things, and, you know, it's how we approach them and the scientific method. It's a process, you know, where we're willing to unreal the, uh, or reveal the truth, whatever it is. So, hey, that's my view on talking about these controversial things. So, but now, to you know, respect to your point about the transmedium travel, uh, what struck me from reading the New York Times article is, like you said, it, it seems to move unphysically, like changing directions, uh, going in and out of the water without a splash, or like coming from 80,000 feet to sea level without, you know, like, you know, think of the space shuttle re-entering with all the flames and stuff. So no sonic it almost, boom. yeah, yeah, what they describe, it doesn't sound real, you know, and, and so I imagine, you know, what if it's like a laser pointer, like how we, you know, entertain a cat? you know, with the laser pointer and he chases the dot, you know, but, but That's yeah, cool. the lady, the New York times, you know, obviously we got the cockpit videos and the shipboard radar, you know, the central radars on the, on the carrier groups are seeing it too. So, you know, first it doesn't look physical for all the reasons, the transmedium travel, the rapid accelerations, the lack of shock waves, the lack of heating, you know, just all from the New York Times article, what the pilots describe, it doesn't seem physical. But they see it on the videos in the IR, presumably, and they see it in the radar. So, uh, so I thought, well, maybe could it be like a plasma ball, like a ball of plasma, like you have a, have a uh, and you ionize the air in a spot, like the cat laser pointer. This is all I could think of was the cat laser pointer. <laughs> and, you, and you make, you know, like this ball of ions. And so it's just reflect the waves because you got to reflect the radar, you got to reflect the IR, and it has to move on physically. Hmm. You know, that, those are three tough things to reconcile, or at least two tough things. So I don't have any thoughts, except again to express my astonishment for what those pilots are reporting because. You know, it's just something beyond conception, really. It does, it's not physical. So, yeah, something's missing. Well, I have a further thought. Yeah. Good. Yeah, please. Like, uh, you know, in the past 10 years, 
it, we suddenly realized that police officers were shooting unarmed black men. I don't know if you remember that. You know, there's an older guy, like it came up. And the reason was because now everyone had cell phone videos. And now when this happened, when the police would shoot an unarmed black man, someone would get it on video. And then we all learned, because everyone had cell phone, this was happening. Now with the UFO phenomenon, I don't recall a, like a discontinuous, like we invented videos. Now everyone's got a video camera and all of a sudden UFO takes a dramatic turn of awareness. It's an industry going back to the seventies, you know, when we would dial the phone with a click, 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 you know, sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, so that's weird. So where are the camp, where are the cell phone videos? This gets to the reality of the whole thing, you know, the physical reality. Well, there's so many, yeah, I mean, there, there's, it could be an entire conversation in itself, of course. And, uh, I, but I, I appreciate you, you sharing some, some of your thoughts on that issue. I was really curious to ask you just because, I mean, I, I see, I see a connection obviously between this idea of propellantless propulsion and these unbelievable maneuvers, whatever, whatever these objects are not, not even necessarily physical objects, but whatever this phenomena is my sense is that perhaps perhaps there's some some overlap there or i don't i don't know but so i i, I really appreciate you sharing your 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 thoughts on that i've been thinking a lot lately about the evolution of humanity and like as a collective there are a lot of crises a lot of issues that we're facing in the world right now as a collective um that's demanding a sort of a deeper evolution in humanity as a collective can you um, share some thoughts on the evolving role of of science in in uh, your you, well your your I'm curious as well just your view on on uh, the situation but maybe we'll hone down the the, the question a little bit to uh, your thoughts as to the evolving role of of science and spirituality in kind of this the. Uh, uh, momentous era of humanity that we're living in. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, uh, you said you felt a revolution was coming or something. And I think, you know, maybe it is a spiritual revolution uh, and, or a singularity. You know, in sci-fi, they talk about the singularity. Yeah. The AI, you know. I think, you know, we, maybe we could have a spiritual singularity or some consciousness singularity interesting uh, can you say more about that well i, I mean i just you you were you're familiar with the concept of a singularity right uh yes. you know it, it, i'll just say you know in ai like we did evolve it develops and develops and something gets smart enough it's like a quantum change and then it's sentient you know and then you get right. terminator scenarios or whatever or <laughs> or just more efficient online shopping i'm not sure <laughs> Sure. Very much. But it seems to me when I see what's happening with your generation, my kids' generation, the good people, I mean, there's a lot of crazy. You know, like your generation is very responsible. You're facing, you know, big things. It almost feels like it, it could be a singularity in consciousness, you know, an emergence of the importance, you know, that we're all in it together, the connection the humanity, you know, just stuff, you know, that our fathers and grandfathers have forgotten. Mm. You know, the guys who fought in World War II remembered, I guess. Mm. Their useless kids have obviously forgotten. And, you know, now here we are. <laughs> so it's up to you guys. Uh, so I, I do see, you know, wonder if it could be a spiritual singularity. And science is part of that. If you look in the course of human history, you know, we were grub, you know, in the grub and the mud for 50,000 years, you know, and then boom, the scientific method and 300 years we're walking on the moon. You know, that's kind of like a singularity. Oh, yeah. So I think uh, we could have something, you know, maybe we're in it, you know, a scientific spiritual singularity. You, you never meet a true scientist who's crazy or mean or you know scientists are solid good people so people that would meet in a convent or a monastery or a church you know they're searching they're serving something greater you know so 
science, religion, consciousness, responsibility, and love, you know, c- coming together in your generation, you know, what that is to some degree. Well, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I still have like at least 20 other questions or, or dis- discussion points that I would love to raise with you, but um, I think we've covered some great ground today. It's been about an hour, so um, thank you so much for for taking the time to to join me here and and sharing all your thoughts. And uh, maybe we can do this again sometime soon. Um, you know, just having this conversation with you again is is giving me like more and more thoughts that I would I'm <laughs> really curious to ask you about. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jonas. I really enjoyed it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, these are important questions. And like we said, not everyone's interested in this. So I'm, I'm glad you are. And I enjoy talking about it, too. So let's, let's do it again real soon. Absolutely. And uh, before, before we close off here, can you uh, share with the viewers, uh, if they're curious to um, you know learn more about you, is, is there a website or a uh, um, I certainly do encourage everyone to check out this book. Uh, it's available on Amazon, The Spirit of Reason. Uh, is there, how can people find you if they're curious to learn more? Yeah, think, th- yeah thanks for mentioning that, Jonas. Um, yeah, uh, they can find uh, all of my work uh, or a lot of my you know, scientific work, cultural work, Spirit of Reason, other stuff at my website at confluence.org. And that's Confluence spelled with a K. So it's K-O-N-F-L-U-E-N-C-E dot org. And uh, I'll include a link to that. you're interested in, you're interested in. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. And yeah, it's you can see my email and contact info. And, and uh, people reach out to me all the time. And I typically write back. So I invite anyone to contact me. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Thank you so much once again, and thank you to all the beautiful viewers out there for tuning in, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video.